Sure, um, here we are guys. Um, thank you all for being here. And thank you for cherrying there. Uh, Rob, very, very grateful. Alcoholic, hey? Um, hey Rob. What, a, what an amazing journey that I'd like to start with. And I just want to start off with a little bit of gratitude of this morning, and even just to put it like simply, you know, it's a simple program. Just to drive here, you know, I'm coming down Scott Street, and I look to the left just outside the pick and pay, and there's someone who I wasn't treating for. Mm. And I was like, wow, you know what I'm saying? It's like, this program works if you work it. And, you know, there's a difference in working it and not working it. And there he is on Scott Street, and here I've got a car with a beautiful wife, two beautiful kids, you know, driving, and I'm like on the way to, to, to share my story with other Alex and our pilots. And, Oh, it's like, it brings tears to my eyes. It's like, guys, feed the white dog. You know what I'm saying? Because that black dog, that black wolf, black dog is out there. And um, what we have is the only disease that tells you you're okay, but it actually wants us dead. And it really does, you know? Cunny, baffling, powerful, and throwing a patient. You know, so it's just, wow. Let me get, let me get to my story. The next thing I know this program works is, is that um, I was sharing with Keith, we're coming down the hill on Friday, and I said to him, sure, Keith, I remember that first year share I did, so let's go back, back, play the tape back 13 years, and I promise you that share, okay, it was a lot more overwhelming, like my parents were coming down, and you know, my dad was still mobile in those days, and, and, his, uh, and his girlfriend, but his wife, Joanna, was coming, and Don was around, and Keith, it was just like, oh, I remember the countdown for that share, and, that's, and you know, it's like, wow, it's a, it's a lot, things are a lot easier these days. It's still like, it's overwhelming and you feel like, you know, sure. You know, you can feel that you're alive is a good way to put it, but it's, it's nothing like it loses that, 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 um, that overwhelming power, that um, forward slash paralyzing, you know, that's, that's pretty much what it's like, you know, how I associate it to, I really, like back to speaking to groups of people. Um, but let me get to my story. So I come from, if you want to call it a so-called Average family, you know, uh, grew up in Johannesburg. I had an older brother, you know, two and a half years older, always a bit bigger than me, um, a lot more of an academic, you know, you could open a book and you would ace it where I would like struggle. But give him a plug or leave a fix, he couldn't do it. And God creates people with different talents. And that's why only later on did I realized that always I like envy dead. He's also good at sports, you know, so envy dead, and you know, so he got into drinking, and our first drunk was down here. We came in Honda down to Ramsgate, and um, we went to got a bottle and everything, and I was actually drinking in front of my dad, this poor Hogan thing, I was dropping the, 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 the cork, and uh, oops, we dropped the cork over the counter, my dad thought there was water in this bottle. But he found out there was, was about 10, 15 minutes later, when, hey, there was not. All I remember was, oh, we need to pump his stomach, and we kind of put him in the cold shower and everything, and that was it from the, you know, from the start. It's like, like, you give me alcohol, and it's like, I, I literally, I don't drink something, you put water there, I don't drink something, I down it, you know, and that's, that's just who I am. It's like, Different chemistry, different genetics, different makeup, you know, it's like, that's, that's who we are. And then I discovered, you know, how to, how to use that for, for all different walks of life, you know, I mean, you know, when I was, you know, forward to a tape, you know, going to school, like going to socials, I could actually dance, I could dance with girls, I could speak to girls, I could actually, you know, be part of if I drank, you know, so it very shortly turned into what I used to call my Superman t-shirt. Um, going through school and everything, it's like I got a matric, I um, started noticing alcohol was a bit of a problem when I got gated, you know, I used to walk into school, I'd have my blazer, I'd be 12 beers under the blazer, you know, walking like a weight tester, you know, but meanwhile there's 12 beers, and then we used to open them at, at school, like, you know, <clears throat> like that, crazy stuff, like, as we do, the, the alcoholics say, and um, that's, that cycle carried on, but at school, just still like it, I, I got gated for that, and everything, you know, but it, it carried on through school when I started um, seeing that it was a problem, though, when I started studying, and everyone was able to go and, and you know, to, to study the night before, like, an exam, and I couldn't get out the pub, like, the pubs and nightclubs, it would be, like, you know, I'd go straight from there, like, try and, you know, cram study, and then it just, it was an absolute jerk. Didn't do, didn't do well, hey? Um, so managed to qualify eventually at the graphic design and um, after yeah just quite a quite a struggle and um, and then worked in advertising for a while worked in advertising for about one year and then um, went diving with the Duana for for about a month and after that month I got back and I thought oh, I can't sit behind a computer you know so left there was out of a job and I was like what am I going to do and then I found a job of my profession I became a bartender. And I did that for uh, at uh, Joburg for the first two years, moved out of that place, moved on to another place, so I thought it was very hip, 
use cafes to flare the bottles and it's like wow living living the dream you know but going nowhere slowly and I got into one of the, like a, I thought it was a serious relationship and she was like what are you you know come what are you doing you know you can't be a bartender so I was like okay so we had a lot of friends in the in the film industry so got into the film industry which is another fantastic profession because we're doing commercials not commercials you do back to back so you're doing like three three four days at a time rap party and then those rap parties coping into lots of drugs a lot of alcohol and it just starts you know that that cycle just starts chasing you you know that's that you know so i was drinking a lot and, and drugging and um, i was working with a, an agent call a crew and i started missing jobs i started getting a reputation like i wouldn't arrive on the because the rap parties are too good i wouldn't rock up i'd rock up and then find excuses like oh, oh then i'd get lost and i'd go straight and use and and, and drink and, and using then was starting to become you know a bit of a which is starting to raise its head um, yeah, in the film industry, um, things started to, yeah, it was, it was going bad and then I was getting to the age of about 26. Now at that stage, you had to be 26, you could, you could get your British passport with your father, being British, which my father was. And I tried a couple of times, I used to go like wasted to the High Commissioner in Pretoria and I used to try and get it, but I never got anywhere. I was missing a few documents, and marriage certificates and, uh, and some others. And I just never could get there. So I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go over there and I'm going to get my British, British passport. And which I did. And as I said, the doors were closing on me. So I thought, by going over, the, over to the UK, hey, it's a new start. And I'll go over there, start a new life. Um, and just before I was flying, my mom opens this book and I mean, just like God working, and she finds the marriage certificate, which is like a major thing. And I managed to muster the other stuff. So I got to the UK, and I'm not joking, in, over a long weekend, so efficient. Over a long weekend, I think I had it in three days, four. The, the British passport, but landing in the UK was the most prominent thing that stands out for me, is that Rob followed. You know, we're allowed to, with, in those days, fly with two bottles of alcohol, two bottles of cigarettes, I think they're both, but the bottles of alcohol, two bottles of straw rum. You know, and that straw rum, so I'd come back from the nightclubs and that, and um, I would hit the, hit, you know, the straw rum, and then it just leads to straight blackouts. And then those blackouts, it's getting arrested, and all those sort of things. Um, so I started not rocking up for work, you know, in the UK and started things that, yeah, it was in a short space of like two months, the doors were closing. That's the progression of my disease, it was moving. And my brother was in Spain and he said, it was June, July, and he said to me, um, come over for, for, the, for the summer, come over for, you know, July, August. I was like, okay, you know, so I was, uh, got a ticket, went over to, to Spain, yet again, Rob followed, and uh, yeah, the doors over there, you know, was just like, gee, you know, that this, this progressive nature um, was just hectic. I eh? uh, started doing tele sales over there, and what happened over there was like, I uh, discovered, discovered um, ecstasy, eh? and that ecstasy was like, sure, oh, I'll do orders for the weekend, and I'll be ta- finishing those orders by the Wednesday. I get on the t- Monday, on the, like the Tuesday, but finish by the Wednesday. <laughs> so that cycle was just like, oh, it was like crazy. So. And in those, I met um, my ex fiance uh, in that time. Um, cost of the soul turned into cost of the pain, you know, and we, we nicknamed it. And it's the most beautiful place, you know, in Spain. And I had, like, um, the British Pass was part of the EU, so I had everything, everything going for me, but I turned it into cost of the pain. You know, where like, every, every avenue you turn into, and that, you just like, you know, it turns into a dark place. Eh? And yeah, that's just my disease. So eventually what really stands out there was, um, so I was doing chili sales and I was doing a bit of construction. On the construction site, um, I had my boss underneath me one morning. I'd been drinking and hanging on like, um, like crazy and, um, and t- popping and taking drugs. And bosses underneath me hadn't stepped in a few days and I'm busy drilling. And I had my first, my first uh, like the shake spell and first panic attack. And which I wasn't aware of it that morning. That morning I'd had coffee, so I thought, oh, come on, it's the coffee that gave me that panic attack. It's not the drugs and alcohol, lack of sleep, or all, all three of them. Combination of probably not eating, nothing spiritual, you know, just absolute mess. And I'm shaking, so I thought, oh, I just want to have the coffee. Carry on doing what I'm doing, tomorrow it won't be there. Well, guess what? That panic attack was there the next morning, you know, the coffee. And that cycle of panic attacks kept, st- stayed with me. So whenever there was a little bit of pressure, like anyone was looking at me, I had to go for an interview, anything, those panic attacks were there. Only way out of the panic attack was to, was to drink or take drugs. And um, that cycle then, it just progressed. And nothing that really stood out for me in Spain, eh? sure, is that I took, used to take the Monday off of drinking. And that Monday, I used to call it my day of clarity. And once I lost that Monday, it was like, that spiral was just like in a tight bend. I was just like going nowhere. I was just absolutely in the spiral. And I just that flexing on the getting and the using. 
and it was just like wow, just typing that spiral. And um, yeah, so then I, after then after um, after two years of Spain, I then came back to South Africa, which um, I spoke to my ex fiance and we came to to a conclusion that she was like she's going to go back to Danish, she's going to go back to Denmark, she's going to go do a recce and see how what it's like to live there. I'll go to South Africa and do my recce and see what we get, which which country we're going to go to. I get back here. I write off what I have left. I've got the car here, so I write off my car. And it was not, wasn't just a write off, it was a hit and run as well. This guy went in front of me. I was on, you know, it was crazy on the way to the Shabin. I remember I had this Levi's top on, there was just beer all over me. I could see with the I take my shirt off. You know, the cops arrive. I run away from the cops. Now I'm in, in, in hiding. So, of course, what I you know, um, say to her is that I was too scared to go back to my, bro to my, to my brother's place. I was just like, I'm literally on the run. And those were like two, three weeks of that. It was hey, awful. Sort of stuff like you don't want to go get the car because in your head the police are going to come get you. So you just leave the car. It like, can just stay there, you know. And that's, you know, and that's sort of, you know, so I spin that story to her that, oh, South Africa is terrible, full of crime, Denmark's the place to be. So guess what? Off to Denmark, here I go. And she said to me, please, arrive sober, you know. <laughs> can you just do me that favor, arriving sober? So I said, yeah, no, I arrive sober. And on the plane, what I do, I get to, to Oliver Tambo, I think it was again, Smith Oliver Tambo, and um, fly out and I try my best to be sober, I to try. And, and I've been, you know, been wasted the, 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 obviously the evening before, going and everything like that, the time before, and I'm trying to arrive at the sober. And remember, I mentioned those, those dreadful panic attacks. Now, it's a miracle I can even get to the, to the plane now, without having these panic attacks. And I get to passport control in the, I find KLM in Stockholm in the Netherlands and there's passport control now. I've checked in and everything. All I've got to do is walk through with my luggage and give them the, the passport because it's going to stamp it. Nothing else. I'm not going to go through anything. And I get to the counter for people in front. I see I make eye contact and I veer off. It was a six hour stopover, six hour flight to load, uh, get on the next plane and the countdown starts. I've got six hours to clear that passport control and I can't do it. You know what I'm saying? I can't do it. I get there, I've tried numerous times and I'm bearing off. And I'm like, they're going to arrest me soon, you know, but I don't get through there. And you think, what's this guy up to? So the only way to do it is to drink. You know, so I drink and so, you know, there it robs yet again. Rob gets through passport control but arrives drunk. And that cycle, you know, was, um, was the story of my life from there, you know. I arrived there drunk and, yeah, that's it. Nightmare, you know. Um, Lots of people pregnant after that. Um, it wasn't long after that that she had me on, you know, living in Denmark, she had me on antidepressants um, and also uh, anti abuse. You know, I used to go to, it was, I used to, when they used to tell me at four o'clock in the morning to put the music down, I would put the music up, you know, and then I'd end up with a hair dry in the back of my head on occasions or, you know, the it was just like crazy. The, the police would come and arrest me. I'd wake up in this holding cell, you know. I'd have me for days. And eventually, the states, you know, her and the state put me on, put me on anti abuse. And so I have to go in twice a week and I put on a strong dosage. I promise you, it's like having like a box of matches and stuff in my mouth. And I did that for six months. But oh, that was like absolutely white knuckling, you know. It's like the Grand Prix was on on a Sunday and it was like I'd sit there, like watching the Grand Prix, like an out, out trade. We, had, we went out to restaurants. I'd create argument, like I, you know, I could, as a good alcoholic, I could smell a beer a mile away, you know, it's like absolute white knuckling stuff, so yeah, crazy, and then after about six months of that, that really stands out, is that um, she arranged this holiday, you know, the surprise holiday, going away for my birthday, and, and I managed to get my drinking license back, I said, look, I've got this thing now, I've got it lit, I can, um, I hang out, so a few drinks, so rather than, it was in Paris, eh? so at least South African, wow, like a week, a long weekend in Paris, wow. And um, what a nightmare in Paris. We arrived in Paris, got my drinking license back, I didn't even make it. You know, you've got, it's 24-7 there, so you can drink, you know, like it's, it's on every corner. And that night was just crazy, you know, there I am, you know, bars and carrying on. She's in the hotel where Zara was just born. Um, the next day, I'm trying to get money from her and she's trying to get the passports. You know what I'm saying? She had the money, I had the passports. And it's like, it's just this vicious. You know, the most beautiful place, Eiffel Tower, all these beautiful things around, and here I am causing havoc, you know. Um, just in that quest and that thirst of drinking, you know. Anyway, get back to Denmark and it wasn't long. She threatened to get me deported, and which I don't know if she did, but I was on a plane. That was the last time I saw my daughter. Um, she was a year and a half at the time, freezing cold snow, and that's the last time I saw Zara. And I got on the train, came back to South Africa, 
and it was like, wow, that that spiral was crazy. It was just like everything was just you know closing for me. It was like, wow, like every everything I tried was just like, yeah, it was a nightmare. Got back, um, started off and uh, got back to Johannesburg. It was got into another relationship, with some relationships. Um, she was um, pretty much, uh, yeah, I can't say, I can't say she was like me, but, but uh, an addict of my type that definitely was one of, uh, was, you know, used a lot. I could get to the Wednesday, just be that eye contact, look at each other and we were going with dealing, you know, and that's how that, we were working together as well, which was really, we were working well, I could work. And then it was, yeah, so it was, didn't last long, that relationship. So eventually my brother was in Cape Town um, and I flew out to my brother and, in that was just you know just absolutely crazy he got into another relationship with one of his exes which made things really messy and um in all of that he then went to the philippines uh, that was my last my last stunt overseas was to the philippines that's sure oh, this stands out i remember in the philippines 7 7 11 again i uh, do tell you one of the only jobs you can do when um when you you know drinking and carrying on the way I, the way i was and there's a 7 11 down there and it's it's, it's cheap as chips to drink at and it was, um, yeah, the stuff called fire water. And I promise you, this stuff was giving me that cycle that someone speaker spoke about. Ryan, he said, um, you know, when you're drinking to, to wake up, to pass out, wake up and pass out again. And that was what, what, what I was pretty much doing. And I remember looking up at the wall in this hotel, this dodgy hotel, and I looked up and there was this Grim Reaper. And, oh, I don't know if, uh, who, who in this room have seen that, but that was like, really if that didn't give it wasn't enough to give me the gift of desperation and i just don't know because that was just like wow absolutely like horrific stuff and i remember then trying to get out of it trying to get out of that mess you know get back to you know just to get back to south africa so i managed to get my passport sorted out i, I managed to get out of out of the philippines i mean the philippines you think it's a dream new oceans but you know i landed in makati and i made makati like a wow i mean it was you know it was just yeah an absolute like as my, my drinking and using was a nightmare, you know, no moderation, it was just full throttle, you know, insanity. Um, so I got back to go back to South, got to back to South Africa to Cape Town, and my dad's side of the family was there, um, was the, you know, the kids and that, and then Glenda. And I arrived there and um, I reached out to Ollie and I said, Ollie, I've got to get to my dad, I said, I've got to get into treatment, and I found myself at the at, the first treatment center, you know, first it was on the rocks. I remember was, I had my last bottle and I'm standing on the rocks, like trying to drink this bottle. They were seasonally washing me off this, off the rocks. And it's just like, oh, I'm gonna go to treatment. You know, this crazy stuff. After about three weeks, you know, and in a group of about 40, uh, the counselor related me to a Bechle, which is uh, Cape Town, like a streetless person, which I was, you know, I was absolutely a streetless person. And like, not a streetless, a homeless, you know, person on the streets. and and I couldn't see that stuff, so I got out, I was a break, I didn't break, I pushed the bathroom, really broke the bathroom door, like had a, a shit fit. And also, you know, what was there, what stands out, there was a, a railway station. Every time a train went past, my head was on that train. It was like, you know, I just wanted to get out of there. Like, sort of get out of there, feed the disease. And my head was like, yeah, I'll get back to her. You know, always like fixing on other things, fixing on the disease, you know, something that's going to make me feel better. And it wasn't long after three weeks, I did get out. And I got out and it was just, you know, absolute nightmare you know um when i was staying at her place uh, she would if, as soon as i drank she would lock me in the storage room she was staying on, on strand street um, and she would lock me in the storage room you know or i'd come in i mean another one of my classics like i'd get money from my dad and that and I, I, she wouldn't allow me to drink in the flat anymore because i lost my drinking license i would then get her flowers in the middle of that bouquet of flowers i put the bottle of whiskey you know so i put the bottle of whiskey inside the flowers like this get inside and then she'd go down the shower and get ready and i'd start drinking and i'd pop the cap and it goes you know obviously i'd do <coughs> Cop the cat and she hears it, you know, it comes out now a massive argument, fight to break up because now she gets a bottle, wants to pour the bottle down the sink and that's like my life, I do not pour, you know, and that is just the story of, of where I was at, which is crazy, you know, that would break out and I'd get, you know, the whatever, then I got the, you know, whatever cash, I'd hit the streets and one night, um, then I got, spoke to me about it recently, I was walking the streets of Cape Town, she said to me, never go that side of Strand Street at night towards the harbour, which I did, knocked off my feet, you know what I'm saying, it's like, Wow, I got, got to knife, luckily just my hand there, and they literally leave you, you know, in nothing, a pair of jocks, you know what I'm saying, that's what you get left in, you know, take your bag, take your everything. And that's where I was, you know, and she saw it, and she was like, listen, you got to do something, and I agreed, and I was like, listen, so I got a hold of my dad, I spoke to my dad, and he was going to and he said to me, um, oh, sorry, no, I didn't, I got, to, got a hold of my dad, the story, 
got a hold of my dad and then, no, I hadn't got a hold of my dad yet, got on the train, I got on the bus and I came down there. And how I made this bus journey, I just don't know. It was like um, a 27 hour bus journey. And what stood out to that? Yet again, another, wasted another bottle, was a conductor like um, giving me carrots about smoking inside the toilet. And, um, and when it was leaving, because it stops all over the place when it's on its way up here. I think it's a garden route, I don't even know. But it stops all the way up here. And it was like, wow, you know, coming up. And it was, uh, you know, stopping all over the place. And how I, I made it, I just don't know. Anyway, got there. And it was just there. I, eventually, I met my dad in his parking lot in, in, um, in Amstranga. I still didn't even know. Caleb told me where it was. It was at the Crescent. And I could see this look in his eye. And he said to me, Rob, I've got the solution. And that solution was the house on the hill. And when I saw his eyes, I could see that that man, I put him through Helen back. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to give this a shot. I'm really going to try. And I went up, and there's Caleb, full of tattoos, even then he was full of tattoos. And um, you know, we went up the hill. And you know, from an early stage, it's like, I saw Caleb, and I was like, I wondered what he had. You know, this guy was just like cool and sober, you know, and content, and just like living, living, living the dream, living life. You know, I was just like, wow, you know. Didn't know that actually the stuff was up for grabs because I had something that I didn't know what I had. I didn't, you know, I'd been to AA meetings, NA meetings before, but it was like, Rob had something different, you know. It's like, I've got robbism, not alcoholism and drugism. And I'm like, absolutely. I was just like, absolutely, yeah, just a, just a mess, you know. I arrived there and I heard I was there for three months. I remember this is my first day standing, you know, sitting outside and I was like, oh wow, you know. Three months, you know, 90 days, I was like, oh, am I going to do this? And it was just, what an amazing journey. You know, what they said to me was open-minded, willing and honest. And with those three things, you'll go a long way. And it's just like, wow, you know, so I just gave it my best shot, you know, and I, I finished the sketch. I hadn't literally held a pen for, I don't know how many years, and it was just like, wow, to hold a pen. I remember step one, wow, it took me over a month, eh? Recommendation was one, two, two, six in the first month, six to 12 in the second, and third to help others. And you carry on doing that for the rest of your life after three, you work in this program. But that was a recommendation, you know, and those, you know, then I think it, you know, still is. And so, yeah, the first month when I was so behind, it was just like crazy. And I went and, you know, I was battling with that, and I went and saw Keith when I was on about the second month, and probably on about, I don't know, step six or seven, you know. And he said to me, don't worry, son, he said, this type of program, which is what I love about, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, about the green and gold, is that, um, is that you can, um, you know, this program is telling them, you know, it doesn't matter how long it takes you to switch. Are you doing it though? Yes, yes. He said, well then, are you doing it to the best of your ability? Yes. Well then take as long as you need, you know, just do it to the best of your ability. And which I did, you know, and it was, I finished it. And when I finished that, it was just like, wow, that was just an amazing feeling, an amazing accomplishment, because I hadn't finished or completed anything in this, you know. And it was just like fantastic. And, uh, and how things have started working from there, it was just, oh, you know, as I shared about that, that first year share was just like, you know, awesome, you know. And working through all of that stuff, you know, and um, I was living in the Rondarvan at the time, and you know, we all think about that relationship, and we've got to wait for a year, and oh, how can we wait a year? It's, you know, it was a fantastic thing, and I always love sharing my first time. It's not there, because it's, it's, the way I see it is it's there so you can learn to love yourself, because you need to learn to love yourself before you can love somebody else, you know. Because Rob, in all his other relationships, I didn't love myself, so how could I even think about loving someone else, you know? So, uh, it was just, yeah, an amazing thing. And I waited about, it was 18, 19 months. Not I waited, it was like, as I did when I finished recovery, another awesome thing is, is that I, I didn't go chasing things like getting a cell phone. When, it, when he came to me and said, son, you're on the road a lot, you're going to need a phone. You know, that was how I did things. I waited for things to be presented to me, you know? And Tracy, you know, came along and he said, gave that a shot. And we were good friends, it wasn't like we were in treatment together, you know, she came in a few months before, uh, after, and we were friends, it was just like, how that happened was also just, you know, like, this, like naturally and how it happened, it was just, yeah, amazing stuff. And how I moved out into her place as well, it was like, she had a, a flat in Scott Brad the pharmacy, which is quite crazy. And she was, yeah, she was um, out in, in Scopra and they needed to running out of space. So it's not like I wanted to go, I used to go stay there on weekends and some nights during the week, but it's not like I chased to move in with her, but they needed space. So um, Brian said to me, I wouldn't mind going to stay with Tracy for like, you know, I think it was a week or two. So I asked her, she was cool. I went to go stay for a week or two and never left. You know? And that was just how things happened, you know? It's just like, you know, just like let go, put it in God's hands and, you know, if it took me as it will be. 
So amazing things. And then, you know, the smart car happened and things just started happening. So I'm mobile, in a relationship, with this, you know, hey, just great things. Next thing that happened to me was given the opportunity to work at the Cedars. You know, I was doing the maintenance and, and doing the, the grounds, you know, the gardens and that. And it was just amazing days. I had to work, you know, first of all, I was actually in the bananas, you know, it was quite a challenging one. In the bananas every day, you know, but it was just also, you know, um, an amazing, amazing journey. Uh, and uh, I missed out on one, one big thing was my last panic attack that I ever had was in the old dining room in the, in the lounge of Cedars and that was about two, three days in. It was the last panic attack and that was when, um, that's when I knew that this program was working there. Is that people will say to me, yeah, how, uh, how do you know that's this, have you had this lightning bolt moment? My lightning bolt moment was I never had another panic attack after those three days. I can sit down at the table now, I can stand in the queue at the shopping center, I can share in front of you guys, and I don't have this, like, that anxiety coming. It's not just a shake, it's like that absolutely paralysis that you feel. You know, the next thing is, is that I slept the night before, is that I, I know that I've, I went to bed the night before, and it's like, you know, I've managed to get a good night's sleep. So, you know, and with, with that, you know, just conditioning myself. So with that, it was like, that this program definitely does work. You know, anyway, going back to, to how things, you know, progressed after that. So, first year of recovery in the relationship, and then Tracy and I were getting serious, and then so I 